Oh, it sounds like I'd like to try that, the renewing. And we put those together. We've been doing an ending program. We've done a pilot study which shows that the end of treatment, end of 12 weeks treatment is over 75% abstinence, and at six months it's over 60%. We're now doing a randomized clinical trial, a large clinical trial, to see if adding a uh, renovating program together is better than renovating by itself. I don't think it probably is. But they have different mechanisms of action. Now, the second question, though, has to do with patch plus renovating. And renovating is a nicotine agonist and antagonist. So why would you add another agonist, nicotine, to an agonist antagonist? It's because if renovating was a complete agonist, it would have 100% efficacy. So those upregulated nicotine receptors are not fully occupied by a 2 milligram a day dose of renovating in a lot of patients. And they'll tell you that. Okay, I had complete shut off of, of withdrawal symptoms, complete shut off of urge. When I would try to stick it on top of renovating, it had no effect at all. That would be a complete, that would be a person that had complete efficacy or complete saturation. The person says, I'm on this renovating stuff and I'm still having urges to smoke, I'm still having withdrawal symptoms. They're not, they're not complete, they're not the molecules in two milligrams of renovating to completely saturate the system. And so for those, we'll use, sometimes use patch therapy in conjunction or short acting NRT in conjunction with renovating. It sounds counterintuitive, but the patients will tell you that what's, what's working, what's not working, and you need to listen to them. They'll, they'll tell you almost every time. And what do you think of the idea that theoretically also only affects the alpha-4, the two receptor, the whole cluster of other nicotine receptors, which are not addressed by that, and in the very heavy smoker, kind of a simplistic concept, but it's not a, it, it's useful to consider that those other receptors are sort of saying, feed me, feed me, feed me, and providing the nicotine not only states the alpha-4, beta-2, but also addresses some of those other receptors. That's the other side of this. So, so the first time we had this come up was in 2006 when we were going to have our residential program in September. We run it once a month. And we knew that there were a couple of people that wanted to start on the room. They wouldn't have started before they came in, so they want to start on this because they've heard about it. And what we know about this is that, that those patients have very severe withdrawal. And we see it, and so we use high dose nicotine patch therapy based on their serum coating concentration to really help them. Because one of, the, one, of the, one of the severe withdrawal symptoms is loss of concentration. So if you're in a residential program, one of the things you're doing is you're feeding them all kinds of information every day that they have to be able to concentrate. So we said, well, we're going to treat their base problem with nicotine patch therapy like we would ordinarily start them on burning clean, see if they can tolerate it, and ramp it up faster because we don't have a short period of time. And the ramp up is really just to see if they develop nausea side effects. And so when we, we have a situation where we can do that under observation, we'll put them on a half milligram one day, the next day we'll do a half milligram twice a day, and the third day we'll put them on a milligram one of those times and a half milligram, and the fourth day a milligram twice a day, get them to the high, higher dose, but because we can observe and make sure they're not having withdrawal or not having nausea. So what we found out was when we went back and looked at the pre clean versus the post clean <coughs> use of the other nicotine replacement products, the average dose of nicotine replacement, nicotine patch therapy after renovating was 33 milligrams a day. So basically a 21 plus a 14. That was the average. And we didn't see any more side effects, any more adverse events in one group or the other. We also did not see any greater efficacy at the end of the residential, at the end of uh, six months after the residential, because they all were over 50 percent. Uh, absent from smoke, which has been kind of our standard. How much were those patients smoking at that time? Well, the, if you take all 50,000 patients we treated, um, this is a small subset of the groups, like 1,500 in the residential treatment, and they are different. Uh, they're heavier smokers, average 35 cigarettes per day. Uh, they are um, more medically ill, 80% 80, 80 have a tobacco cause disease, 40% are in recovery from other addictions, 20% have have current or past depression. So they're they're pretty comorbid both psychiatrically and medically. So they're a pretty tough group. So having 52% success rate at the end of the year is, is pretty good given the severity of the problem. So 
So, Richard, by the way, please interrupt with, with questions at any time, but you're now the head of this program at the Mayo Clinic. Is the Mayo Clinic smoke free at this point? The Mayo Clinic is tobacco free. We went smoke free in 1987. We were one of the first medical centers in the country to go smoke free, but we were the second medical center in the city. There's another group called the Olmstead Medical Center, which is a small group uh, that started as a spin-off of people that wanted an alternative to going to Mayo for their care. And Olmstead Medical Center was the first medical center in Rochester to become smoke free. So we, our policy was 87, and then in 2008 or 9 or so, it became tobacco free. And it's campus-wide, so it's not only inside the hospital, but on the grounds, in lease space, in cars, and, and free water. So it's very comprehensive. Um, Richard, a personal question, that, um, if I may have to come right back to you. Um, tell me about the pressures that you face from colleagues in terms of what the hell are you doing? Everybody knows you can't get nicotine people with heart disease, and you're getting more than it says in the in the Canada we call it the CPS. I, mean, I forget what the you know the product monograph. And geez, you're just a cowboy. I tell all my patients who got heart disease if they're smokers, don't you ever even walk down the same side of the street and someone's wearing one of those. Killer nicotine replacement patches. Do you must have dealt with that kind of stuff? Well, yeah, and the cardiologists were the more enlightened group, as you would expect, uh, that they were the better group. Because once you show them the evidence, and they, so our cardiologists are very comfortable, even in even in the coronary care unit, if the person's having withdrawal, we give them maybe replacement therapy in the midst of a, an acute event. The real knuckleheads and the real hardheads are the orthopedists and the plastic surgeons. <laughs> I hope there's none of you. There are teeny weeny little brains. <laughs> Code of silence. I think nothing goes outside of this room. You have heard the mythology that nicotine interferes with wound healing and bone healing. And those, those data are based on studies in animals where the animals were giving enormous doses of nicotine and it has some adverse effect on the nicotine or bone cancer. Those are old studies that are outdated and the dose that the animals are given were many times more than what a person is ever get from the nicotine replacement therapy. It is clear that smoking interfered with both wound healing and bone healing. And, and, but it is really almost, it's amazing that the, the orthopods and the plastic surgeons said, if this person stops smoking, but whatever you do, don't use any nicotine replacement therapy because that will interfere with wound healing bone healing. And, that's, and it, it's, it's hard to get through that. We're making some progress, so the younger ones understand this. So it's the older knuckleheads that need to get into their little keen, weeny little brains. Uh, and, and the facts are that nicotine has been shown in, in animals to promote angiogenesis. Okay, so. If you have new blood vessel growth into a wound, you think that might help it heal faster. So the evidence is probably in the other direction that, that we may be promoting wound healing and bone healing. Interesting enough, I got a call about eight months ago from a doctor at the Camel's Clinic, which is in Memphis, and it's an orthopedic clinic. And this, it just came out of the third step. They had a project last year that was focused on this. He said, we as orthopedics need to need to do something about smoking in our patients. And we need help with this. Would you and some of your colleagues come to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons in San Francisco on the 5th of February, 2012, to help us figure this out? So I'll leave on Sunday to go this year. So there are some that are more enlightened. Um, and so hopefully we're on, and so Nancy Rigotti will be there, David Warner from our group, which is, he's an anesthesiologist, who's written about this a lot. Uh, so. We get that feedback, but it's, it's becoming less, and as the evidence becomes more overwhelming, it's, it's, but you may have, it's kind of like when you have an administration that's got a real knucklehead that's ahead of something, sometimes it wait for retirement or death in order to move along, so we have to waste some more time. Um, complete disclosure as a recovering orthopedic surgical resident. <laughs> Our orthopedic surgical colleagues in our own setting here have come to us and now want to have a smoking cessation program in their orthopedic outpatient plaster room clinics, et cetera, et cetera, because they recognize. Uh, well, the, the, the staff on the campus place said, you know, we've known for years that smoking screws up everything we do, so why should we not treat this? So we're going to, I'll let you know on Tuesday how that went. So. <laughs>
There's a question in the back of the room, and then we'll come here. My question was, as a family doctor, we talked to a lot of people, and I'm aware that if you can assist people with their nicotine replacement or their meds, you have a super duper pickup rate in terms of the person accepting that. And then going to the pharmacy to fill that prescription. And then when you track them, they do pretty good. What I'm interested in is how can we use motivators to have uh, more people walk away with that prescription in hand? Because a good chunk of them will go to the pharmacy and pick up the med. So you guys have worked in this for a long time, and I thought you might have a couple of pearls to uh, share with us as to how we could motivate people, kind of like the carrot, you know, how do you get the person to, even though they agree that it's an issue, they kind of like to quit, I'm going to think about it rather than I accept your piece of paper right now. Well, for me, I think that the, the key is for them to understand that we consider this to be a serious medical, the serious medical problem it is. And I introduce them to the neurobiology, even just in a brief conversation. And I do have a, just tell them the story like I did in there. You know, there, there are different types of smokers. So you fit into the category of a smoker that probably is an addicted smoker. That's nothing, that's nothing derogatory about you, but that's just, just happened. You know people who experimented, they never became smokers because nothing happened. You know Uncle Charlie, who couldn't do anything else right in his life, but stopped smoking on his own without any difficulty. He's a different genetic makeup. And then we have the social smokers who drives everybody crazy, and they're different too. So, so your neurobiology is such that we need to treat this more aggressively and work with me and we'll work with you on that. That's one way just to kind of introduce them to the topic because they really are different. Uh, and those that can, quote, stop on their own um, are really different than the ones we see in the office. I think another approach it can also be the, exactly as Richard has outlined, but also saying, you know, why don't you just go away for the next couple of weeks and do nothing else but put this patch on your shoulder and I'll see you in two weeks. And, 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 and let's just see how things go. And those patients will come back and they will reduce their smoking because they titrate their cigarette intake from another. Um, and this so-called RTQ, reduced to quit kind of paradigm, has been shown to be, to be uh, effective. Um, and so I think that's, a, that's another strategy. And, uh, I'm, I'm like Richard, I'm not, you know, Gee, this is an issue we got to, we've got to try to help people understand how difficult this can be. How do you feel about our starting right now? So the other thing is the follow up. Follow ups are critical. I mean, and I tell, I tell patients all the time now, if we had 100 diabetics and I were to say we're going to treat all 100 of you with 21 units of insulin, does anyone think that would ever do that? So we need to tailor make this pharmacotherapy for you and your situation. Combining a long acting medication with a short acting one for symptom control. So, combinations are the rule rather than the exception. And the patients kind of hear that, they say, oh, never thought about that, you know, because of all the advertisements. But in Canada, you have packaging now with patches and gum together. So, you all are way ahead of the game. So, talking to them in terms of this is a medical problem, just like I would manage your diabetes or your Coumadin therapy or whatever else, we can do it in a, in a scientific sort of way. But then the follow ups are really critical. If you put a person on insulin, you would not say, take 21 units of insulin and come back to see me next year. <laughs> so do that. So I want to stay in touch with you. I want to stay engaged with you during the treatment process. Stopping smoking is a process. It doesn't happen all at once. So the reduce the quit is a way of learning about this, but also moving toward the, the quit. Uh, and that's, that's becoming more accepted. 